This tape is being made on the summit of Mount Roberts on September the 30th, 1968. We're on the summit of Mount Roberts at Roslyn, B.C., at an altitude of 6,500 feet above sea level. Directly at our feet, 3,000 feet below us, is the town of Roslyn, the Golden City. And a little farther to our left is the town of Trail, another 2,000 feet below Roslyn on the banks of the Columbia River. We are in a sea of mountains as far as the eye can see in any direction. Away to the east of us rise the mighty Selkirk Mountains, and to the south we can see the mountains in the state of Washington, and a little bit more to the east of that we can see the mountains in the state of Idaho. West of us, on the extreme horizon, we can see the great Cascade Mountains that stretch from the United States across the border into the province of British Columbia. Mount Roberts is the very symmetrical conical peak that one sees from Rossland. It is a photographer's dream in such that it seems to sit in the inverted V of the amphitheater in which the town of Rossland rests, and it makes a perfect setting. Tourists stop by the hundreds to photograph this almost perfect setting with the Alpine village nestled at its feet. Mount Roberts is one of a group of mountains known as the Rossland Mountains, which again are part of what is now known as the Monashi Range. But actually, in the earlier days, this was called the Gold Range. Somehow or other, the name got changed to Monashi. However, we prefer to call it the Gold Range. This was the range, this was the name that the range, this was the name that the range had when the history of this area began. How it became the Monashi Range is another story. But unfortunately, Monashi is not even an Indian name as one would suggest, but it's a Scotch name. So we prefer to call it the Gold Range. Looking down the river from Trail, a, few, a mile or two below Trail, we can see a configuration in the Columbia River that is known as the Lady of the Columbia. A perfect profile of a woman's head can be seen from up here in the Columbia River. And this, of course, is one of the landmarks of this area. Behind us rises the highest peak in the Southern Gold Range. Old Glory, which rises another 1,500 feet higher than Mount Roberts. Old Glory, this, is a, a, this of course, is the American influence which came into the naming of the mountains in this area. Old Glory, of course, is the American flag. This particular mountain can be seen from as far away as Kettle Falls, Washington. On our extreme left and just across the valley from us, is Red Mountain, 1,000 feet lower from where we're standing now. Red Mountain is the center of history of the whole Rossland area. It's also the home of the Red Mountain Ski Club, Nancy Green's home hill. And from here, we can see the ski lift on the top of Red Mountain. And looking just a little bit north of that again, we can see the uh, terminal uh, equipment of the ski lift on Granite Mountain which, of course, is the newest lift in the Red Mountain ski area. Directly below us, heading southwest from Rosslyn, is the Patterson Valley, and we can follow it with our eye right down to Northport, Washington, where it meets again with the Columbia River after the Columbia makes its great sweep from trail down across the border and then flows westward to Roosevelt Lake. It is a beautiful, warm afternoon on the last day of September on the top of Mount Roberts, the kind of a day when one just wants to sit back and relax in the sunshine. It is the time of year when summer is done, things have ceased growing, everything is now relaxed and waiting for the onslaught of winter. As a matter of fact, only a week ago, this peak was covered in snow, but the warm September sunshine has taken it all away and one would never know that there had been a flake of snow to see. <clears throat> Directly in front of me is the remains of an old flagpole which was put on the top of Mount Roberts in the early 90s by very intrepid climbers who made the trip up in the winter to fly the flag on the top of this wonderful mountain peak. 
At that time, of course, as the pictures in our Rosslyn Museum show, the Union Jack was flying from the mast on the top of Mount Roberts here. Directly to my left is the remains of an old cirque, and this is, is the source of annual avalanches. And at the present time, the avalanche track is a riot of color of red and yellow with the autumn leaves on the brush, the huckleberry bushes, and the various trees that, that simply paints a palette that can't be described. The scene at our feet here is the setting of one of the most colorful stories in British Columbia's history, the story of Rosslyn, the Golden City. This story really started 300 million years ago. The sea of mountains that we are looking out on was once an epicontinental sea 300 million years ago. It was the Vancouver Epicontinental Sea. And the lower third of Mount Roberts that we're standing on, this uplifted mountain, its lower third is the strata that was laid down 1,200 feet thick on the bottom of this epicontinental sea before the great Jurassic mountain building period lifted all this area above sea level. But the original mountains didn't last. They were worn away again, completely down to a pina plain. And there is a theory that the great Selkirk range to our east is composed of the sediments washed away from the mountain ranges that stood here at Rossland. A second mountain building period thrust them up again, and now we have the present profile of the gold range as we see it today, after many, many millions of years of changes. The amphitheater of the city of Rossland, which we're looking at from up on this great height of Mount Roberts, was 200 million years ago the site of a tremendous volcano a great volcano that built its cone to tremendous heights into the sky and existed for hundreds of thousands of years and then died out and gradually eroded away. This volcanic action was indirectly responsible for the tremendous mineral wealth that was later gained from the Rossland mines at the turn of the century. After the volcanic period and after a long period of erosion, the great Cordillian ice cap moved down over the continent, and this whole area was submerged in a sea of ice. Only Old Glory behind us, and perhaps the tip of Record Ridge, kept its head above the ice. And as the ice finally moved away, it had sculpted the mountains and the peaks that we see before us to the upland profile that is prominent today. A hundred years ago, the great Columbia River that we can see below us was the route of the fur traders who followed this great waterway down to Vancouver, Washington, which at that time was the headquarters of the Hudson Bay Company. The fur traders skirted this area because there was no point for any of them to come into these mountains. Only Indians came into the mountains at Rossland because of the tremendous crops of huckleberries that grow in the hills. And Salish Indians came up from the river valleys below to make summer encampments to pick berries. And they, of course, were the first Rosslyn residents. Then in 1865, the future Governor Dudney built his famous trail from the Okanagan through to Fort Steele at the Wild Horse Creek Gold Rush. We can see from up here the route of the Dudney Trail as it came across the mountain ranges and into the Patterson Valley and then up the, over the divide, down past Rossland, down through the valley in which runs Trail Creek, and from the creek, of course, takes its name from the Dudney Trail. And the town of Trail, which at the time of Rossland, when Rossland was first discovered, Trail was known as Trail Creek Landing, where the steamboats pulled in to embark and disembark passengers for the mining camp of Rossland. Trail Creek Landing was later of course, shortened to trail, and now, of course, has become the seat of the great Cominco Limited metallurgical and chemical complex. But, of course, Cominco had its beginnings in the mines of Rosslyn. But the builders of the Dudney Trail were too busy pushing their trail through in one season to notice the discoloration on Red Mountain, and if they did notice it, they paid no further heed 
And it wasn't until a quarter of a century later that Joe Morris and his partner, doing assessment work on the Lily May, a claim staked astride the Dudney Trail just across the valley from Rossland, came over in July 1890 to the side of Red Mountain and staked five claims on Red Mountain that day. The Center Star, War Eagle, Idaho and Virginia, and the Leroy. They went to Nelson, they took their samples with them, and they talked the gold recorder in Nelson into paying, into paying $12.50 recording fee. And for this, they gave him one of the claims. He chose Leroy. This was Colonel Topping, who later founded the town site of Trail. Colonel Topping sold his Leroy to Spokane interests for $30,000. In turn, the Spokane interest developed the mine and sold it to the British America Corporation for $3 million. Rossland mines were developed on American capital, mostly from Spokane, and this is still evident in the names around Rossland. We have Spokane Street, Washington Street, Nevada Street, and at one time Lincoln Street, which was later changed to Queen Street. The very mountain peak that we are standing upon, Mount Roberts, was originally called Mount Spokane. It was later changed to Mount Roberts to honor Lord Roberts of the South African campaign. After gold was discovered in Rossland, the camp grew very quickly. And by 1895, it was a booming mining town. Wagon roads were built from Rossland down to Trail Creek Landing and also down through the Patterson Valley to Northport on the Columbia River in the state of Washington. Then came the railroads. F. Augustus Hyance, who built the trail smelter, also laid a railroad down from the smelter to the Leroy Mine at Rossland. This was called the Columbian Western Railway, and we can see the route of this railroad up through the Trail Creek Valley as it twisted and turned, and up through two loops and a switchback 14 miles of track to reach Rossland, a climb of 2,000 feet in 14 miles. Also from Northport, D.C. Coleman built a railroad called the Red Mountain Railroad, and we can see the remains of this old red boat, red, and we can see the remains of this old railway in the Patterson Valley directly at our feet. We can see what was once the famous loop where Heinze had had to build a switchback to get his railroad up the hill, the Red Mountain Railway put in a loop where the road cut right into the hillside and then looped around on an outside trestle and did a 360 degree turn on the hillside and then back down into the valley with a reverse loop and down to the creek again. We can follow this old road bed right down through the Patterson Valley to the border. At the present time, the valley is dominated by a broad ribbon of highway, which is today's modern highway. This, of course, follows the old railroad bed in some places. Directly below us, too, we can see the Rossland Museum, where this wonderful story, this very colorful story of Rossland and the Rossland Trail area is on record for all to see. And, of course, visitors to the Rossland Museum also have the chance of a wonderful trip underground in the Black Bear Tunnel of the old Leroy Mine where they can see workings, stopes, drifts, manways and so forth exactly as they were worked at the turn of the century. Red Mountain on our left is the very basis of Rossland history. The Rossland Mines of course were located on Red Mountain and when the Rossland mines were worked out, the importance of Red Mountain changed from mining to the great white world of skiing. Although, on the side of Red Mountain facing us now, there's a new development, Red Mountain Mines, and a great open pit operation is taking place for molybdenum, a mineral that was useless at the time that the Rossland mines were worked. But now, because of the space age, molybdenum is a very important metal. And Red Mountain, once again, is important in the mining world. But it's all, uh, also Ulas Jelnes's mountain. Jelnes introduced skiing to Rossland in 1897. And in 1900, he became the first champion of Canada. 
at a meet held in Rossland in, in the year 1900. Jelness skied on Red Mountain. It was his favorite mountain, and when he later died in Spokane, he had his ashes dispersed at the top of Red Mountain. And of course, Red Mountain is Nancy Green's mountain. And it is said, local legend has it, that Nancy caught the spirit of Jelness, and this is what enabled her to go on to world championship. On a crisp white winter day against a blue sky, residents of Rossland can often look up and see the great snow plume that blows out from the top of Mount Roberts like a long stream of smoke into the blue winter sky as the high winds that hit this ridge lift the loose powdered snow off the cornices and whip it into a great cloud away from the side of the mountain. The Red Mountain Railway wound its way up from Northport up through the Patterson Valley to our right directly south of us and remains of the old roadbed can still be seen in the valley. The line wound itself up through the valley and climbed 2,000 feet from Northport to Rossland. And directly below us, the valley hit a tremendous dead end where the mountain rises up into the pass that divides the Patterson Valley from the Trail Creek Valley. Here the railroad had to take a great tremendous loop, 360 degrees, and turn back on itself and start up the side of the hillside directly opposite. Then to get back to Rossland, it went on to what is known as the loop, a spiral trestle that took the line out and suspended it along the side of a cliff and turned it back into the mountainside where it entered a cut and went back through the mountain and turned again 360 degrees and once again at an increased elevation headed up to the pass and into Rossland. We can still see the old roadbed which is now used as a roadway and it goes right into the town of Rossland on the upper levels only a block and a half away from the CPR station which railroad came from trail on the opposite side. You can now hear the whistle which is signifying a blast from the Rossland mines. We'll let you hear this blast as it echoes throughout the hills from peak to peak.
sounds exactly like thunder in the hills. And the echo rolls and rolls away into the distance, from peak to peak, from mountain to mountain. Columbian Western Railway started a Trail Creek landing and in 14 miles it wended its way 2,000 feet up the hills to Rossland and terminated at the Leroy Mine. In order to make the steep grade from Trail to Rossland, the builders of the Columbian Western did not have room in the valley for a loop. They were forced to put in a switchback, which can still be seen on the mountainside opposite Rossland today. The railroad entered the switchback through a very tight spiral loop and then the train had to back up one mile to the top of the switchback again through a, another spiral loop which raised it up the hillside about 200 to 250 feet at which point the road then the train then moved ahead and carried on its torturous way up to Rossland. This grade incidentally was four and one half percent which is a tremendous grade for any railway. The tracks were just removed from this railroad, which by that time was a standard gauge. It had been set down as a narrow gauge railway, but the tracks had been removed from the standard gauge railway, which was operated by the Canadian Pacific. They were removed in the summer of 1966. Incidentally, the Red Mountain Railway was taken over by the Great Northern Systems shortly after it was built. And Rossland enjoyed overnight Pullman service from Rossland to Spokane by the Great Northern because the Great Northern was the main artery as far as the businessmen were concerned. Rossland and Spokane were very close. The Rossland mines were developed by Spokane Capital and in turn the dividends from the Rossland mine paid off the mortgages in Spokane in the Great Crash of 1894. We can see the Columbia in the distance at Northport. We can just see the sort of valley fog which indicates the valley of the Columbia River. And it was just below Northport at the Little Dalles that the first steamboat was built on the Columbia River, the 49er. And it ran from Little Dalles up to Revelstoke. And it took the miners up to the great but short-lived gold rush of the Big Bend country in the north. The stretch of the Columbia River that we can see below us at Trail was also the route of steamers from Northport to Trail Creek Landing. Passengers from Spokane would come up on the Spokane Falls, Northern, Spokane Falls and Northern Railway, disembark at Northport, which was the end of the line, get aboard the steamer Lytton, and then make their way up the swift Columbia River to the steamer landing at Trail Creek Landing, at which point they would disembark from the steamer, get on the little narrow gauge Trail Creek Tramway as it was called, but later known as the Columbian Western, and chug their way up to Rosalind in a trip that took about two hours to make this very steep grade. The steamers from Trail Creek Landing also went north and connected with the train at Arrowhead that came down from the Canadian Pacific's main line. This was the route into Rossland from the main line of the CPR. The most powerful stern wheeler on this run was the steamer Rossland. It was the only stern wheeler that could navigate upstream from here to the Arrow Lakes without assistance from snubbing posts on the shore. We are looking at the town of Rossland as it is now, three quarters of a century after Joe Moore staked his first claims. 
no longer the bustling mining town with its main street crowded with miners and worldwide financiers alike. Rossland is now a quiet residential town, nestled as it is like an alpine village in a little amphitheater at the foot of Mount Roberts. Rossland in the winter, of course, is a ski town, the home of Nancy Green, world-famous World Cup champion skier. The wagon route in the Patterson Valley below us, from Rossland to Northport, was a very rough, muddy route, and at one time the Leroy Mining Company had 40 ore wagons hauling ore from Rossland to Northport, where it was put aboard steamer and sent to Butte, Montana for treatment. It is inter interesting to know that Jimmy Vipond, well-known Trail Rosslyn personality, Jimmy's father ran the ore wagons, operated the ore wagons that ran from Rosslyn to Northport. And with the coming of the railroad, Jimmy's father, of course, was put out of business. During the hundreds of thousands of years that the Vancouver Epicontinental Sea existed, it built up a layer of sediment on its bottom of 1,200 feet thickness, composed of mountain residue, composed of volcanic ash, and of course the shells of sea life that settled to the bottom. And this residue, 1,200 feet thick, solidified and formed what is known today as the Mount Roberts Formation. This formation underlies the whole of the mining camp of Rossland. And when this tremendous peak of Mount Roberts was uplifted, it exposed the bottom third, which is the Mount Roberts Formation. And there we can see today a cross-section of this thick layer of residue that was set down on the bottom of this prehistoric warm epicontinental sea. Looking down on Rossland, we can see the colorful waste dumps of the mines that were worked for 40 years. We can see the waste dumps of the War Eagle, the Leroy, the Josie, and the White Bear. The great Cominco complex that we can see on the river 5,000 feet below us had its beginning in Rossland when the Center Star and War Eagle mine in 1906 combined along with the St. Eugene mine at Moye to form the first consolidated mining and smelting company. And from this grew the Cominco complex, the worldwide Cominco limited complex that we know today. The tremendous Selkirk range dominates the skyline to the east of us. Beyond that is the Rocky Mountains. The Rocky Mountains are newer than the Selkirks. We can't see them from here because the Selkirks themselves cut off any further line of vision. However, our horizon from here is approximately 60 miles to the ridge of the Selkirks. The Selkirk Range is older than the Rocky Mountain Range. And the gold range that we are in is older than the Selkirk Range. It is a warm September afternoon, the 30th day of September. And the bright red and bright yellow of the autumn leaves and the deep green of the conifers show up against the gray rocks of this mountain, all backed by a deep, deep blue sky. It is an afternoon when one wants to stay on the mountaintop forever.